Uh, I'll start with myself to set the kind of the pattern, and then you guys do the same thing. Um, a two-sentence intro uh, for who you are. Uh, my name is uh, Knut. Uh, I'm the uh, director of storage architecture, and uh, my primary responsibility is the architectural definition for SSDs, and we develop some of the core technology uh, for SSDs. Take it away. Raj Javadkar, uh, I am a director of uh, system and chip architecture. I work on atom based uh, system and chip uh, designs. I'm Neil Milkey, I'm director of reliability methods and currently specializing in non volatile memories and um, solid state drive reliability. I'm Jeff Clowney, I'm the CTO of our developer products division, so I work on compilers and tools for programming IA. I'm Tom Piazza, I direct all the graphics architectures at Intel. <laughs> He's been trying to get rid of this microphone since we sat down. Uh, Kevin Kahn, uh, Director of Communications Architecture in Intel Labs. All things communications and policy for communications, I guess. Ajay Bhatt, um, Fellow and Chief Architect in PC Client Groups. I work on desktops, notebooks, tablets, and other PC devices. Jim Helm, uh, director of many core architecture at Intel Labs, responsible for our research into the future of multi-core uh, from software down to circuits. All right, so the format's going to be, uh, if you have a question, uh, you raise your hand and wait till the mic comes around. When you have a mic and there's a gap, then go ahead and ask the question. Uh, please use a mic because it's a pretty big room, so uh, that we can hear you and everybody else can hear you. If your question is deemed by me as being worthy, uh, then I'll uh, dash out and then give you your card. But I want to hear the question first. So uh, go ahead, knock yourselves out. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> to the right. There's a couple over here on the edge.
Carnegie, all things graphics, right? Yes, all things graphics. I actually thought I'd make it through two days without that question. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't think so. Okay? Simple answer. The question, we have an echo up here, so <laughs> what went wrong? Uh, uh, God, stump the chump, huh? Um, I just think it's impractical to try to do all the functions in software and deal with all the software complexity and you get into performance per watt issues uh, trying to do these things that naturally a rasterizer wants to be in fixed function. There's no reason to have to program it. It takes so little area for what it does relative to trying to code things like that. So I think it's just a function of what's the right level of programmability and what's the right level of fixed function. And that's the whole story. Yeah, that's Does, I think if I heard your question, was the acquisition of McAfee mean that we're going to take everything into hardware? Uh, if that was your question, uh, then I think it's pretty safe to answer no. There are things that software can do that hardware can't do and vice versa. I think there's a synergy though that we're planning to exploit between hardware and software combination and the co-design of the two. Security is a very important direction for us going forward, as mentioned in Paul's keynote I believe, yesterday, uh, and having software expertise and products, as well as hardware expertise and products, means we can look for the, the combination that strengthens our platform. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, your, one of your fellow uh, Jenny Bell's Genevieve claimed she was channeling me, channeling me in a meeting recently, so I guess I get to channel her. Uh, no, I think it's a balance. Um, you know, we certainly are continuing to do a lot of race research across Intel uh, that is what you would think of as, as kind of fundamental driven by the science and engineering issues of, of just building better computers, building better graphics, building better communications, etc. I think you should think about her experience-oriented work as an enhancement to that, to say we can, there is some of that that we can direct more effectively if we understand how computers are being used. So it's not an either or. Um, you know, I mean, look, making a faster transistor is still gonna be making a faster transistor, but I think the question of how we do optimization across the systems we build, particularly as uh, more and more of the system comes on chip, uh, those are questions that get increasingly directed by the application space that those parts go into. And that's where I think the work her lab uh, is, is doing will be very helpful. Uh, mentioned Genevieve, for instance, a question that other than having a famous cave manager moderator, uh, the panel is remarkably politically incorrect. Why is this and what, what can we do? <laughs> 
accusing us of being politically correct or politically incorrect? Of all white males. You're all white males. Well, Genevieve decided not to come. I don't know why. Last time I checked, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are three women fellows at Intel right now, and unfortunately, none of them are here today. I don't know what we did to. Ah, oh, there she is. Hey, we're no all right. Come on. Come on. Now we're no longer have a chair. I just got fire. done channeling you. Was that a cue? No, did she pay you to introduce it? And I'll just mention that goatee on Canoe was just a disguise. <laughs> Yeah, those uh, medical commercials, I do those on the side. <laughs> Genevieve arrives fashionably late. It's an entrance. All right, there's a, a bike thing needed in this area pretty soon. So I have a question about Stellarton, which is the uh, FPGA on the same package as the Adam processor. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see that as a kind of a technological cul-de-sac, or is that an approach that you think has a long-term future potential? So I think uh, it's, uh, we look at it as a more flexible approach to allow for quick, uh, low volume products to be built as derivatives of our uh, chips. So it gives us tremendous flexibility. More importantly, it gives flexibility to our customers to be able to program uh, new functionality very quickly without having to wait for it to be integrated on die. So that's a big advantage. We do a quick timeout. We already introduced ourselves, and now we have a new guest. And so, um, in two, uh, two sentences, we will introduce yourself. I, I grovel with apologies. I'm sorry. I'm actually not really here, so none of you should tell my boss, who's in the next room doing his keynote, that you know where I am. Um, so, Genevieve Bell, I am the director of our Interactions and Experience Research Lab, and I clearly don't know how to dress properly, and I'm a cultural anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, I actually know how to dress somewhere else, just not him tell. <laughs> okay, we started talking about SSDs. Would you please make comments on the general science for SSDs of the future? And then flash perhaps is not the one. Ah, good question. I think that goes maybe to me. You're the best guy for this. So the question was about... The comments on material science for reliable SSDs and future uh, NVM storage. So you're talking about beyond NAND flash, or the scaling of NAND? Uh, beyond NAND, since NAND is not going to cut it. So beyond NAND, there's certainly a lot of candidates out there with no established winner in, in the industry. There are efforts to uh, extend NAND using um, track-based approaches, TANOS and so forth, uh, not floating gate storage. Um, I think the uh, semiconductor industry certainly has a long history of people who have uh, predicted uh, the demise of scaling for any given generation. Uh, DRAMs should have stopped scaling actually in the early 80s with discovery of, uh, of soft errors. These limitations are, are hit and then overcome. So I think the jury is still out on exactly what's going to happen with, uh, with NAND flash. We'll see. But uh, certainly Intel, beyond uh, you know, a couple generations out, um, is seeing the emergence of phase change memory, which is a um, you know, solid state um, uh, uh, physical phase change in a material element. Um, and that does have some advantages for uh, solid state drives in terms of direct access instead of a block architecture. But you know, the industry is just rife with uh, all sorts of uh, different initiatives by different universities and companies in that area. And no one can claim that the, you know, the clear winner is proven and established. Uh, light beam sounds like a pretty compelling technology. Is that on any kind of standards track, or is there any plan to make it anything more than a science project? Oh, it's definitely being looked at as more than a science project. Um, truth is, we're actually spending a lot of time talking with, with our Customers, fellow travelers, in the industry about what's the best approach on standards. There's no answer right now, but it's an active discussion uh, as to you know what mechanism, what body, who's involved, etc. Uh, so you know that's when I think you'll see answers sort of evolve out of the industrial discussions over the next I don't know six months or so. But uh, there's you know we've got you, 
you saw a real live running silicon out here. There are real customers, you know, who have product plans around some of that stuff in pretty standard form. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's kind of moving the way you'd sort of expect that kind of a new technology to be moving at its inception. All right, double card points for the first question to Genevieve. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> or two. So switching direction a little bit, uh, the cloud computing area, uh, having been around where I actually started putting punch cards in and submitting in and waiting to get an answer, it almost seems like we're going back to the future with cloud computing mm -hmm. that I don't have the information at my fingertips, instead I'm waiting to go somewhere else to get it back in. What, what can we learn to not go back to the future and have the same problems, and what is the direction after cloud computing? I didn't quite get the last part of your question, but I think I've got the alternate. Uh, cloud computing to me represents the recognition there's a tremendous amount of data and compute resources available over what's become a very respectable pipe. We have widely deployed broadband and wireless broadband. Uh, that, however, won't scale, I believe, as fast as the compute capability will, or the data storage is so I, I don't think we're going to a world in which we're always reaching over that pipe to a cloud uh, for everything we can do. I think there's a natural balance that will strike at any given point, given a particular application and a circumstance between compute on the cloud and compute remotely. Now, what's really interesting in the latest cloud business model developments is new approaches to compute that remote environment. The, uh, the business model of offering a, a platform as a service or software as a service, each of those, I think, open up new compute opportunities for us to draw on data computation and retrieval and, as well as a scalable computation at the moment. But we're always going to have to learn from the transition away from the punch cards and the glass house that people want personal computing resources in hand because that scales very, very well and each person having their own compute. It gives you some privacy and it, it gives you latency that the rich, immersive, visual computing kind of applications that are appearing, uh, people seem to really value, are going to need. So I think we're going to learn from the fact that personal computing means people want personal computing, they want mobile personal computing. But that doesn't mean with good connectivity we can't draw on uh, resources from all parts. Let me just add one thing about uh, cloud computing because it's something I bumped into lately in some of my work here. Um, and that is that you know we really have a lot of meta questions to answer that affect how cloud computing rolls out, particularly in areas of privacy and security that uh, Jim was referring to. Uh, and some are well beyond what most people even think about. So, you know, what exactly is the legal status of your data if you're using a cloud service that happens to put uh, one of their uh, data centers in France? You know, you're a U.S. citizen, perhaps. You think you're dealing with a U.S. company that's giving you cloud services, but because of the time of day and the, you know, maintenance schedule of the data center here, your data happens to be stored in some other country. What's its legal status? There are some questions of that ilk uh, that, are, that make actually that particular question even simple uh, that we really have to get our arms around worldwide if we're gonna answer some of the privacy and security questions long term. So they, these are really complicated issues that I think are gonna modulate how all of this stuff rolls out. Uh, this might be the culture. Uh, We, we acquired Wind River about a year ago, right? and they're continuing in their existing business uh, of supporting sort of embedded and, and, and computing. But uh, they're helping us a lot with our Atom development, and we're using them as a way of the software we produce. They're, they're, they're We still got the two for one deal. <laughs> All right. Um, well, the, uh, to talk about the, what is the usage model in the emerging markets for net purpose versus no purpose? Because um, at least the first 12 months of Adam's launch in the emerging markets, net purpose really have not sold that well in presumably the most natural place where that book could go to. Um, is it, 
I think one of the challenges when it comes to thinking about the difference between network and network technology was also realizing that when you talk to cross emerging markets, you needed to make a difference between price and value, and that many consumers weren't just interested in price, they were interested in value. And value of the consumers that I've spent time with over the last 10 years, there was always a sense of not wanting to be sold something um, subpar, which is really not what Adam was, but I think there was a sensibility about whether this was a somehow stripped down PC versus something that was actually optimized for the market. And if you look at the success of things like uh, Tata's Neo Car, for instance, there are clearly ways of thinking about how you deliver both value and price that make things successful in the market. So I think it's a matter of kind of getting the right balance kind of about whether it's about a price point or whether it's about delivering a holistic experience. What is uh, Intel doing? Uh, have you been using keyboard device ever since? I mean, you mentioned computing in the 60s and 70s. Um, what is Intel doing looking at alternate, uh, you know, haptic interfaces, uh, other types of gesture-based computing as we move forward uh, in the field? All right. I'm trying to answer the question. Okay, you are. Do it in two-part harmony. Age before beauty. <laughs> So yesterday, if you were at the keynotes, you may have seen, um, you know, some of the things that we're looking at. Clearly, we're looking at sensors and um, cameras and other methods of uh, human-to-machine interaction. Um, I think this is an incredibly interesting area where we can provide new experiences. And I think Genevieve's lab is looking at a whole bunch of uh, use cases. Yeah, so I think, you know, there's a couple of things again there that are interesting. One is that at the moment, most of the next generation user interfaces, so things like voice, gesture, and touch, are really still being thought about as simply replacements for a keyboard, a mouse, and maybe a remote control. But if you start to imagine what would it look like if those become not just controlling mechanisms, but means of interaction, means of creation, means of sort of establishing a new glamour of how we deal with the objects in our lives, that's a really kind of rich space I have happily, yay, a lab that's working on precisely those questions. And so for us, it's also about recognizing that, for better or worse, a keyboard is particularly good for certain kinds of things. I mean, the kind of vocabulary of where I come from, I think we would argue that a keyboard was kind of a stubborn artifact. I mean, the fact that even an iPad has a keyboard and tells you something about the durability of it as a particular way of creating things like text. So I think, you know, the chances are that you're going to see other things moving into that space, but certain kinds of other sort of older technologies don't necessarily immediately get replaced. And it's certainly the case that not all new forms of interaction are going to make sense. When I've spent the last five years in our consumer electronics business, and it's certainly the case that while the engineers I work with spun out wonderful stories about what it would be like to talk to your television, none of those comprehended the fact that most living rooms have more than one person in it. And having a television be smart enough to work out who's allowed to tell it what to do, <laughs> when I'm willing to bet most of you in the room have it worked out when you're not supposed to have the remote control, um, we were asking televisions to be smarter than we ourselves could be, and well, that's a nice problem to have. Working out where your voice is going to be appropriate, where gesture is going to be appropriate, and not just technical problems, they're social ones too. All right, now just to be clear, the two for one deal was for her first question. The two for one deal is like done. <laughs> so, a uh, question about wired versus wireless uh, I.O. Uh, today, what's sort of the difference in performance per milliwatt? You know, you get like a per milliwatt between the two. And how do you expect that to change over time? Yeah, I, I don't. The laws of physics are not magically changing. Uh, communications uh, cost in the generic overall form of cost. The cost can be actual dollars because of the number of transistors it takes, or it could be uh, energy because the amount of work you have to do uh, is directly related to how good the channel is. Now, wire is a you know infinitely, almost infinitely better channel than is RF. I mean, I, as somebody who's been around RF for a while, I find uh, you know radio still. Truly, <laughs> truly. I mean, the fact that cell phones work is just mind shattering if you actually think about the channel. It is abominably bad. Um, so, 
you know, the kinds of things that we do to make RF system solutions get better. Um, you know, in general, haven't even been applied to wired channels because they didn't need to be. Now, some of the techniques actually are, right? So, I mean, we start to do things like equalization and, 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 and that sort of stuff on wires. And that is a primitive application of stuff that has been done in the wireless space for a long time to the wired channels compensate because you're getting up to where that channel isn't so good. So, I mean, I, that differential isn't going to change. I think what, what does change is kind of similar to what Knut was referring to in the SSD world before, which is uh, the definition of what can you do that's good enough. And so, you know, if you decide that you only need a certain data rate for a class of communications, once you can achieve that data rate reliably with wireless, uh, the fact that you could go, you know, five times faster, ten times faster at the same cost on a wired channel may not be relevant for that application. So, you know, I mean, I, I, that's, I think, for me at least, that's the best way for me to think about the, that trade-off, is that, you know, where you can do wireless, it's enormously convenient, obviously, that's why we all love it. Um, it but it's not somehow going to get as easy as a wired form of communication. It's just that we've gotten smart enough and good enough to make it good enough for a larger and larger set of the I.O. problem. Let me add, uh more to what he said, what has changed in the last you know, 20 years or so. When we first did USB, we were sort of, um, the first USB was down at 12 megabits per second, right? And then we went to uh, 480. And now, you know, USB is going at 5 gig or PCI Express or whatever else, you know, we've increased the speed tremendously. Wireless is also going from 11 to, you know, we go to 60 gig, you know, depending on the distance it'll go up to three, to 3 gig or so. The thing that has changed is cost of computing has come down. So what we're able to do, you know, when we were doing USB, to compress a video was very, very expensive. Um, and, you know, the channels are not fast enough, but these days, you know, uh, even Atom has encoded. So if we can encode the data and reduce the data rate and still maintain good enough quality, then a whole bunch of new applications can be enabled wirelessly, right? Um, and you can get free to it. That wires are here to stay, and where you can use compute effectively, and this is what I think Kevin was trying to also say, then you can go wireless. By the way, the other, the other thing about wireless that's only a challenge is it doesn't have anybody to make space. Yeah. No. And wired solutions don't. Yeah. Uh, and there's a fixed amount of spectrum that's separate spectrum for each wire. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, those are all the other factors that, that figure in here. Uh, I wish I had made this Also running an industry initiative called the Data Enterprise NDMHCI, which is for the 
purpose of standardizing the uh, programming interface for uh, PCIe-based SSDs. I believe, uh, I'm not, um, I don't speak for Fusion.io, but I believe that they have their own custom driver that goes with that. And uh, our, uh, I'm kind of a client guy, so my experience has been that the ubiquity of the solution is improved if there's a standardized registry interface so that you have the option of having standardized drivers from Microsoft and Linux and so on. So that's the purpose of the NDM HCI is to create that uh, standardized uh, <coughs> programming interface in order to uh, make those uh, PCI-based SSDs for enterprise uh, a little more uh, uh, uniform across the industry, I guess, in terms of the programming interface. So we're absolutely doing um, uh, things in the PCI-based SSD space. Second part of the question was, what are we doing so apps can take full advantage of it? And not really, not so much of a, a software guy. Uh, maybe some of the other guys here uh, will have a better background there. But uh, my general experience has been that uh, uh, if you bring it, they will come. Uh, so there is some, uh, some effect to that. Uh, we also have some specific items that are being worked on as part of our PCIe SSD program to streamline the software stack to give really uh, uh, efficient access uh, to the underlying storage media to the apps. Um, but I'm not really the expert on some of the, uh, the, the app based stuff. Anybody else have any comments on the apps? <coughs> Uh, Paul opened the uh, IDF um, by telling us all that Intel uh, had become or was becoming a solutions company. Um, over the last two days, talking to the analysts and press community, I would say, by and large, they have no idea what that means. Uh, Jeff's got uh, solutions in his uh, title, and I haven't spoken yet, but I'd be interested in, in some others of you telling us why Intel has to become a solutions company and what difference that will make in your job.
operating systems and drivers and all that goes with it, that tremendous amount of integration of a complete system that we're now shipping, particularly in the mobile space. So if we don't offer those to our customers, make sure that they have them and generate many of them directly themselves. I think Wind River acquisition reflects that need. Uh, then we're, you know, we're going to be left with a partial piece of the answer for customer to deliver. There's so much that's needed beyond just the raw silicon if you're talking about uh, such a high level of integration. Yeah, I was going to take off a little bit more on what Kevin said and throw a twist on it. Um, you know, there are certain, I'll call, standards in the industry, and one of the things from a graphics view, I'll just take this one, uh, talking to a lot of the community out there, where they really want, strangely, a direct X device in a market which has been normally done on OpenCL, for example, to, and it gives them the wider view from an operating system. What they're really after, when you talk to them, is that there's a wiggle suite I'll get you to where I'm going with this. Microsoft is the only company out there forcing standards, let's say, on graphics. And in the OpenCL or OpenGL community, it's the Wild West of exactly what that feature means, what the behavior is. So if you think about it from the standpoint of integration sets its own form of standards, even if it's against an API, and you can create some stability in the workplace at the same time as a solution for what people are going to is. But I also make an understatement is that we need to understand what the customers really want. And I'll play off of something that was asked before. Te is it technology for technology's sake? You know, I personally don't understand why the graphics requirements for a BlackBerry are turning into these direct X9 type things coming from customers. When I'm sitting there going, my usage model is what I like about my BlackBerry is I don't have to charge it up for three days. And if we start throwing these things at this, it's going to basically sink under its own weight. So to a sense, I think, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. You know, what you can do in graphics in a millimeter squared is like 16, 8, 10. So if you go back, you know, 10 years where we did integrate, in 16, 8, 10 has more performance. That's in one millimeter squared. Has more performance than all of the handheld graphics devices today that are taking 10 millimeters squared. So I think there's what do the customers really need, and maybe not doing technology for technology's sake, and put some stability around these things is what we need to be doing. Can, can I take this style of question in a slightly different direction? Um, we find it a little more weird than the, the process is a nice so far. We can replace a whole bunch of that PGA work with CPUs instead. Um, but I noticed with all the SSD instruction extensions, etc., they're mainly floating point and they're not a bit of manipulation like adding a barrel shift at the moment. Are you considering anything to do with taking more capability away to replace FPGAs that are very expensive? And are you thinking about any tools to help that transition as well? FPGAs offer an opportunity to do rest. Some emerging requirements or some niche requirements for a specialized design. And where it comes into the mainstream processor is where the need is broad enough that it makes sense to put it into our high volume manufactured general purpose processing. Uh, and we watch carefully those workloads and, and the requirements for the point which they reach critical mass justification and use, potential use as well as actual use. We don't just focus on floating point. We look very carefully at all of our flows and examine bit manipulation and other operations since the encryption instructions, for example, in. So uh, I think, however, there will always be a role for that kind of special purpose FPGA, for example, for people who have a narrow need, a specialized need, uh, that doesn't make sense to try to uh, burden the entire market with <coughs> being able to satisfy. So they are a source of, of new workloads and new opportunities, but I don't think it's, it, we need, need to try to displace that with a general purpose problem. It's not, it's not also not needed at all, right? The standard example is a good one, where if you want to combine the flexibility of both, can do that on a package and provide a lot of flexibility to the customers to make the functionality.
fragmented market as quickly as possible. The embedded market is extremely fragmented. It counts up to the 43 market segments. And you can design a product to meet all of those. But by combining these two, you can provide lots of flexibility and time to market. Not just time to market, but customization. Extreme customization is possible with that FPGA paired with the general purpose, which I think is very natural for the, the marketplace is going after. Not only get out quickly, but with something that can be particular to a need or customized to a degree you can't even with the It allows the customers to differentiate. Them. So you can have your differentiation in the FPGA part so that you can combine that with the general purpose part and still be uh, have your own uh, uh, customization and differentiation. By, by the way, I don't think a year goes by that I haven't seen a project, or probably actually more than one project, in the research lab side of things, looking at how do you add some form of malleable capability to the processor. Um, and some of those projects have led to things that have kind of you know found their way into, in, into some of the things we've introduced in, you know, in, in at least spurred form. Um, and a lot of them haven't really found that nugget that, you know, how to do it in a way that's more than a curiosity. Um, and I think that's really the challenge, is, is doing this kind of stuff in a way that actually is broadly enough useful, but it's, it's valuable to, you know, a decent kind of customer base. Um, you know, it's very, very easy to get stuff that's like 98% on the mark, but that 2% makes it useful, makes it useless to any particular application. Uh, and so that, that's the research. So we continue to research it. Uh, and often what we discover is within a, a full application on something like a reconfigurable uh, FPGA design, there are key operations that aren't more generally applicable. And we pull those in and thereby push out the need for, for reconfigurability generally. But I, the other trend I see, similar to this answering, is the cost of doing an application specific integrated circuit is so high now that what used to be developed on an FPG and then put in an ASIC uh, faces a tremendous barrier of required volume in order to justify the mask set. And the, the customization uh, and flexibility of the FPG piece, I think we're going to remove some of the need for what used to be done that way. All right, so just as time check, folks, four minute warning, so we've got about one or two more questions depending on how involved they are. Good afternoon. You are new with uh, LGI. I would like to know more in the last update regarding optical or light computing. What, what, what would you like to know about the core computing? Optical or light computing? Well, optical or light computing. I don't know that we have any real serious work going on in optical computing. I mean, optical interconnects, yes, and you've seen certainly the work there. Uh, and we've got a lot of work going on in this area of silicon photonics. but. Same trail, uh, going integrating, integrating more and more and more into the processor. Um, as the memory bandwidth is a big problem for us, so how far down the road should we think that the memory will go into the processor, not all the memory will go into the processor, 3D stacking, any of those solutions might kind of help us. Uh, how many years do I need to wait? What are the old grades? Uh, memory bandwidth is increasingly limiting factor in the design that they put a lot of cores on the F380 to fuel. Uh, but there is memory on our processor right now. If you watch the growth of cache, that's the memory hierarchy coming on the time. And so it, it is a balance there of how to achieve power efficiency on connecting to memory. Uh, the 3D gives you extreme connectivity, but it's a real manufacturing challenge. Uh, that 3D in the sense I think you mean with through silicon via is the connectivity. So we have research in that area. I think at some point that may make sense, but it's an extreme solution uh, where we can satisfy the need other ways. It would probably be more economical. I think what we should expect is we will continue to improve uh, and we've, we've been publishing extensive research on the ability to drive the IO to memory and other connections off time. More and more power getting down to, to single digit type of picadules per bit transfer on and off the time. I think that's where we'll go. Uh, together with uh, multi-chip modules bringing uh, for certain market segments where a larger cache is appropriate, bringing cache into 
today. I have a, a request of you. Um, the, we have to take the scorecard seriously. It's just you know, not just an exercise. Uh, we aim for, for good scores. Now, I, I scanned the questions on them. One of the questions is whether people are in context that, or whether they understood their material. Um, there's another question on whether the material was very good. And I think that the way these are weighted, they're about even. And so, um, when they compute out the total score for the class. And so I just thought I'd point out that the slide that's up here, that's got to be like the most fantastic slide. <laughs> All right, so um, the, uh, the fellows there are wearing these distinctive shirts, and so uh, you, uh, you may be able to catch us in the hall later. Uh, of course, we're all going to change our shirts really fast. But uh, if you see it, uh, someone wearing a fellow shirt, then uh, go ahead and grab them in the hall for follow-ups. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for joining us. Hope you had a good time.